If you do not have a sermon outline, please lift your hand. These kind gentlemen would be glad to give you one. In fact, you will certainly need one this morning. In fact, and some of you are saying, oh, I think the machine messed up. I got two pages. No, if you look at it carefully, the machine didn't mess up. Mess up. You got two pages, um, actually four sides, um, because we want to dive back into our study of Hosea. And um, it is rich and it is power, powerful. In fact, this is kind of interesting. I have received more emails and more texts on this Old Testament passage um, so far than um, on any other sermon series that we've done. Apparently, God is doing something in your hearts and in my heart as we are looking at, at a church, as a church to the book of Hosea. Um, the Old Testament very often is a little obscure to us in this modern day and time. We've become too busy. We've become a little bit too fast in our, in our furious life, and we've not taken the time to look deeply at the tremendous message of the whole of Scripture, and so our church is taking some time to really look at a very, very important little book of the Bible, and it is opening much of the Old Testament to us. In fact, I have repeated with a little bit more detail the gray box on the front page. And this, and I think some of you that maybe have been in church for a long time and been studying the Bible, even this little gray box and some of the comments that we make to the right are going to pull together things that you've never understood before. I believe that that's going to happen in the next five minutes. And there's others of you that this whole thing is new to you. You've never really spent any time reading the Bible. Well, good luck. I mean, not good luck. Good news. <laughs> Just kidding. Good news the good news is this, you're getting an orientation that many of the other people wish they had had decades ago. And I really mean that. If you will look at the gray box and if you will read a little bit as we zip through an overview of the Old Testament, you're going to be able to pick up and begin reading in the Old Testament with a little bit of background, a little bit of effort. You'll be able to really understand where much of it is going and where it has come from. So this morning, I do want us to look at the title on the top of the page um, or there on the screen, God's Gracious Prosecution, Conviction, and Punishment. You say, wow, that sounds so uplifting. His prosecution and conviction and punishment, in fact, those are legal terms. And we see that because God in the Old Testament is bringing a case against his people who are unfaithful to him. And it's, we see, though, there's a key word in our sermon title. And I want you, if you would, take your pen and circle there at the top of the page the word gracious. Would you circle that word? Because what we're going to see this morning is that it is the grace of God. It is a loving, merciful, listen to this, even sweet grace that comes and brings the case against us and brings a conviction and even a punishment that would come and bring us to God, bring us back to Him. So notice the box, the gray box there. If you're new to this, this is great. Sure, the Bible begins in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 with creation and Adam and Eve, and we see at the very beginning, right there at the start, you see Cain and Abel, and we know that Cain kills Abel. And so the very, the very first two that are born wind up one being a murderer and the other one being a victim in this. And we start to see human strife even from the start. In fact, it gets so bad that God raises up a man named Noah to build an ark. And here God raises up he and his family and, and has a plan that is a picture of salvation. And it's this beautiful picture of how God is going to bring his judgment, but he's going to yet still allow his grace to flow upon the earth. Notice, skip forward about a thousand years and we come to 2000 BC, Abraham and his wife Sarah. And they have Isaac and we see Jacob and eventually Joseph. And we see that Joseph goes and he's sold into slavery into Egypt. His brothers take him there drop him off with a caravan headed to Egypt. Joseph winds up in Egypt, and what God, excuse me, what his brothers meant for evil, his, his God meant for good, and the whole family was saved. And then we see 
the nation of Israel grow in Egypt. Fast forward about 400 years, and you come to Moses. They're under great oppression. The regime has changed in Egypt. No longer are they friendly to the Jews. No longer are they friendly to them. But now they are hostile. They're in slavery. And God is going to show his gracious hand and deliver them out of that slavery. And they are led through the wilderness over to a place that God has promised to them. A land flowing with what? Milk and honey, we're talking about a good place out of the desert. We're talking about a glorious place that is fertile. And because of Moses' sin, he couldn't go into the promised land, but Joshua would become their leader. And then we would see a series of judges. And then around 1,000, right above the word or the number 1,000 BC, we see the kings, right above that, the kings. Saul, David, Solomon. And then we come just shortly after that, to the divided kingdom. Now, I want us to skip over to the right-hand side. Let's catch up a little bit with the notes on the right-hand side. We need to remember the grand outline of the Bible. If you're new to us this morning, this will be really good for you. Here it is, creation, God creates. We see the fall, not only creation and fall, but this key word is what? Redemption. Everybody say redemption. Here's the bulk of the Bible. It's about the redemption and the restoration of God. God, fill it in here. God, in his underlying amazing grace, chooses a man and his offspring through whom he will bring his salvation to the world. Now, he actually does this a few times. If you think about it, he does it through Noah. But really what we're referring to here is Abraham, and that's right out there to the side of that statement. It's Abraham, that God makes a promise to Abraham. Abraham, I am going to bless you, and through you and your seed, all of the nations of the world are going to be blessed. Notice the next part here. God makes a covenant with his people. He makes several covenants with his people, but we see this covenant of him being our God and us being his people. He is faithful, yet his people are what? Unfaithful. Yet God miraculously delivers his people again and again. If you go through the Old Testament and you see the exodus out of Egypt and you see God coming and rescuing them out of the hand of Pharaoh, rescuing them from various troubles and struggles all along the way, God is providing for them manna and food in the desert. God is saying, let me show you how I can take care of you. And yet... The law of Moses is given so that we can see that God is holy and we are not. Some of you have wondered, why did God give the law of the Old Testament? The whole point of the law is to show us that we cannot keep the law in our strength. We cannot be perfect according to the law. Instead, no matter how hard we try, we cannot keep God's holy standard. Therefore, we need a Savior. And this is the great picture of what Christ comes. So instead of God for their leader, though, his people demanded, fill it in, a king. They wanted a king. They said, other nations have a king. We want a king. And so God gives them Saul. They, they come and we see this and And in Saul's life, we discovered that God is saying, it would be so much better for me to be your king, but you've demanded a king, you have a king, and Saul, being so powerful yet wicked, he begins this line of wicked kings, and so the kings begin. God promises blessings and curses, um, blessings for obedience and curses for captivity in exile for unfaithfulness. Now, those two key words there, captivity and exile, are very important because those play into the rest of the history of Israel. We begin to see that God's people, because of their disobedience, experience God's judgment. In fact, I want you to look at the screen in front of you. I'm going to read 1 Kings chapter 9, verses 1 through 9. Now, First and second kings tell the story of the kings and the divided kingdom as well as, as it begins the united kingdom. 
not the UK, not Britain, but the kingdom of Israel that was united that would later become divided. And I want you to hear what God is saying to Solomon, the last king of the United Kingdom. And listen to what he says to Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 9 and verses 1 through 9. As soon as Solomon had finished building the house of the Lord and the king's house and all that Solomon desired to build, the Lord appeared to Solomon a second time. So this is a, this is a very special visit. He does this twice with Solomon, the first time, and now here he is the second time. So there's an important message that God is going to give him. As he had appeared to him at Gibeon, verse 3, and the Lord said to him, I have heard your prayer and your plea which you have made before me. I have consecrated this house that you have built, putting my name there forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. And as for you... If you walk before me as, your, as David your father walked with integrity of heart and uprightness, doing according to all that I have commanded you and keeping my statutes and my rules, verse 5, then I will establish your royal throne over Israel forever. As I promised David your father, saying, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. Verse 6. But if you turn aside from following me, you or your children, and do not keep my commandments and my statutes that I've set before you, but go and serve other gods and worship them, key key verse here, verse 7, then I will cut off Israel from the land that I have given them and the house that I have consecrated for my name. I will cast out of my sight, and Israel will become a proverb and a byword among peoples, among all the peoples. Verse 8, and this house will become a heap of ruins. Everyone passing by it will be astonished and will hiss and will say, why has the Lord done this to this land and to this house? Verse 9, then they will say, because they abandoned the Lord their God, who brought their fathers out of the land of Egypt and laid hold on other gods and worshiped them and served them, therefore the Lord has brought all this disaster on them. And so we see that here at the kings that Solomon is told, if you remain faithful to me, you are going to receive these blessings. But if you go out after the other gods, you are going to be removed from the promised land. Now, this is all all going to come together and make more and more sense as we go this morning. Notice this next statement there to the right. The kingdom is divided into Israel, that's in the north, and Judah in the south. All but a few of the kings of Judah do evil in the sight of the Lord. Here's the deal. All the kings of Israel did evil, that's the northern kingdom, and uh, and all but just a few of the kings of the south, they did evil in the sight of the Lord. They were wicked kings. I want you to see the map in front of you. This is what the kingdom looked like under Saul, David, and Solomon. But because they chose to go out and because they chose to, to adopt Um, kings and to place kings after Solomon that were wicked kings, the kingdom is destroyed. The kingdom is divided. And so we see Judah to the south, the yellow kingdom, and we see the blue kingdom to the north. And now all of a sudden, God's people are divided. Notice here on your outline as well, both kingdoms grow. This is so sad. Both kingdoms grow indifferent to God. So they don't even care about the God who delivered them from Egypt. They don't even care about the God who parted the Red Sea and they walked through on dry ground. They don't even care about the God who provided food. They don't, they don't even care about the God who opened up the promised land and gave them riches beyond what they could possibly imagine and Solomon and all of his glory. But because Solomon too went the way of wickedness, these calamities would come upon Israel. So both kingdoms, fill this in, are headed for exile. If you're under 40 years of old, 40 years of age, and you're not sure what exile means, you can just put out there, getting kicked out. They're getting kicked out. It's when your parents kick you out of the house, you're exiled, okay? 
Um, so exile, to live in exile means that you're not living in your country. You are living in exile. So they're indifferent to God. They begin worshiping other gods, and they're about to be kicked out. Now, much of the prophecies of the Old Testament where there were a few prophets that were good. Many of the prophets were false prophets and evil, but all the ones that we have their prophecy written in the New Testament, these are righteous and good prophets. They are declaring God's words. They are faithful to God's word. And we see that they are declaring a don't leave the God who loves you. Don't leave the God who delivers you and provides for you. Notice this, the prophets are sent by God to call his people to underline it, to return to him. He's calling them to come back to him. But their message is what? Rejected. All of the prophet's message is rejected. There's a few places where there's some repentance here and there's some repentance there, but by and large, the prophets, as we see, do not have, and certainly Hosea's message is rejected. So there, so they declare that captivity and exile are coming. That's what the prophets start to say. And when you are reading the prophets of the Old Testament, when you're reading Daniel and Haggai and you're reading Malachi, we see that there are the judgments of God coming to his people saying, turn back, turn back, turn back, because if you don't turn back, you're going to get kicked out. And it's going to be very, very hard for you. So we see that this is... uh, where the Old Testament is going, fill this in. So they declare that captivity and exile are coming. First and Second Kings tell the story. So this helps you understand in your Bible. First and Second Kings tells the story from about 971 to about 561. There's some other uh, history parts that tell after that to about 450. God sends the pagan kingdoms, and this is important. God sends the pagan kingdoms of Egypt, Syria, Assyria, Babylon and Persia to bring his judgment on his people. You say, well, you you mean that this wasn't like God was nervous about what to do about the Egyptians coming back after them or Syria or Babylon or, you know, what was going to happen? No, God was fully in control and God is using pagan lands to do his work in the hearts of his people. We see this throughout the scripture that God is working. In it all, this is important at the end, in it all he promises that his love will win. And he will turn their hearts back to himself. And here is where we see throughout the Old Testament that salvation is of God. It is from God. Salvation is not in ourselves. We're given every opportunity and we still blow it. There is, there is no way possible when you read the Old Testament for you to see that these people can save themselves. And this is what the law shows us and this is what all of their disobedience shows us that despite God setting them up for a, for a beautiful obedience, they run away. So, God's gracious prosecution, conviction, and punishment, which is what we come to for chapter 5. And let's just remember why are Bible passages on sin and wrath important to us? And this is so important for us to see. Number one, we've said it for the last couple of weeks, because every last word of God's holy word is what? Eternally important. God's word does not go out of style. It may go out of style with American Christianity, but it doesn't go out of style in the cosmic realm of his glory. You see, my friends, God's word is eternally valuable. And his people who study his word and come to know and come to listen to his word, we come to find that there is blessings in all of his words. Number two, because superficial diagnoses lead to false remedies. You see, if you start to ignore portions of God's Word and you start to get away from the holy God who's been working through all time in history and you start to pick and choose kind of from smorgasbord Christianity, you are not going to know the real problems and the real solutions. In fact, you're going to misdiagnose the problem and you are going to have false remedies for your problem. There's no, band-aids rarely help with cancer. 
Usually it takes a much greater work than a Band-Aid and triple anti B. It takes a whole lot more. And so as we look at this, we begin to, we begin to see that the full message is very important for proper understanding. Number three, because understanding sin and wrath will make you wiser. If you and I begin to see what God, who God really is and what he really wants, we will be wiser. Number four, because understanding sin and wrath will warn you from great danger. If we will look and see the way God works, and if we will listen to what he has said about where sin leads and the inclinations of our heart in our fallen state, we can avoid much trouble. Number five, if we will study sin and wrath, we, we will be blessed because understanding sin and wrath will help you cherish the true gospel. It will help you cherish. It will help you love the true gospel. You see, I know you're flipping your sheet, and that's fine, but we still have the same root problems as the people of Israel. We still have the same, the same issues. The Ten Commandments haven't changed, and the, the inclination of our hearts to do the wrong thing is the same. Just kind of think about these. We still have a tendency to worship other things. You say, no, I don't. I'm not worshiping Allah, and I'm not worshiping Buddha, and I'm not worshiping these other things. No, but we've said over the last couple of weeks that in, in America, in modern day, we can worship other things without having to go to a temple or without having to adopt a new set of doctrines. We can worship other things by obsessing about the world that we live in and focusing on that. We can start to see that sexual immorality rules over what God says. Lying, cheating, cursing, greed, hatred. I mean, some of these are even the ones that Hosea mentions in chapter 4. Those things are still problems in our hearts, even here at Sheridan Hills. We have the same root problem. That has not changed. Flip your sheet if you haven't already. Look at the key concepts of understanding Hosea chapter 5. The first one I want you to see is that God's judgment upon his people is very different than his judgment upon his enemies. We just need to understand that he's not judging his people the same way he judges his enemies. There are pagan nations. And you know what's interesting about that is we hardly even ever hear about their demise. It's, only, it's, it's not even hardly worth mentioning. And why? Because God is not saving them. They have chosen to go away from him. And except for some that God sends Jonah to go preach to Nineveh, and God sends others, and we see some others trickle in. They're in. Other nations are invited to come and see this God. Come to Jerusalem and see this God. Come to God's people and see their faith. But we see that by and large, God is not dealing with all of their sin. God is dealing with his people's sin. And you, that's going to make more sense here as we go. That should be encouraging to us. Notice the next part here. God in his wisdom, mercy, and grace is bringing his people back to himself. That's what we're seeing happening in Hosea 4, in Hosea 5, in Hosea 6, especially next Sundays. We're, we're going to see that. But, but notice this, that in his wisdom, in his mercy, in his grace, he's bringing us back. There's another thing that we need to remember, and this is a good thing for you to just mark down as you study the whole Old Testament and as you live your life here in 2019. God is never in a hurry. God has plenty of time. He is patient and he is purposeful. God is never worried about what's going to happen next. God is not worried about what is going with the course of events for the world or your life. The picture is, is that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever. In fact, his own name means this, he who was, he who is, and he who will be. And so time is not a problem for God. We feel the issue of time. We're thinking, oh, wow, only a few more working years until I retire. Or, oh, man, I'm young. How much is the world going to change between now and over the course of my life? Or the some that may be much older is saying, man, I'm in the fourth quarter. Things are drawing down to a close. How much longer will I live? Or what is happening here with my life? What have I accomplished? What has happened with me? None of those issues are a problem for God. 
God is in no way related to or limited by time. And so when he deals with the nation of Israel, what may be decades, I mean, Moses was on the backside of the desert for 40 years before he came up to the burning bush. Now, Moses might have been thinking, wow, 40 years, I'm about here, kind of doing my own thing in Midian. And then he comes up and God has a task for him. But God is also not in a hurry to get them into the promised land. They disobey God. They come and they, worship, they make a golden calf. And God is saying, this whole generation is going to pass away. You're not going into the promised land. Because you have immediately, after everything I've done, you're going out and worshiping other gods. And so we see that God has time. They do not. And so as time goes on, God is accomplishing his purpose in the big picture. Notice this, God is gracious and he wants to bring change into your life. God is gracious and this is part of what we see in chapter five, that he's bringing change into your life and he has all the time and all the power that he needs to do it. So quite honestly, you may want to put out there to the side, the quicker we get with the program, the, gracious, the, the more um, we are ready to experience his blessings. Well, let's look and let's see this passage, and we're going to fly very fast. Those, those words of orientation, I think, will help us greatly as we read right now. Look at Hosea chapter 5 and verse 1 in the box. Hear this, O priest. Pay attention, O house of Israel. Give ear, O house of the king. For the judgment is for you, for you have been a snare at Mizpah, and a spread a net upon Tabor. Verse 2, and the revolters have gone deep into slaughter, but I will discipline all of them. This first verse starts out with the same word as chapter 4, and it's the word here. God is saying you need to listen. You need to hear what I'm saying. You see, we get in a lot of trouble when we don't listen to God. In fact, even for um, Christians in this modern day and time, if we just kind of consider ourselves New Testament Christians and don't listen to all of the counsel of God's Word, we can get in trouble. We can get off base. We can miss important things that God has for us. There are three different words that are used in chapter 1. Look what it says, and this is part of the poetry that is playing out here. This is when you see it broken up like this, um, the form of it. This is poetry. Look at verse 1. Hear, o, hear this, O priest. Look at the next word. What's the next word on the second line? Pay attention, O house of Israel. What's the next one? Give ear, Give ear O house of the king. Very interesting that, that Hosea is writing at God's command this unfolding picture of you really need to listen to what God is going to say hear, listen, or pay attention, give ear. It's very interesting, that last one that is used there, give ear, is this kind of idea. It's that when someone is coming beside you and speaking gently to you and kind of privately to you, that that you need to give your ear to them. And so here we see that God is even inviting Israel to listen carefully. He's saying to them, Give me your ear. Come draw close. I'm going to tell you what you need to hear. See, notice that next line. In love and gentleness, God is calling them. In mercy, God makes clear that they are under judgment. They're not under judgment and ignorance. God is telling them what the problem is. You know how miserable it is um, if someone is upset with you and you don't know why. Um, that can really show some real codependency and some other things that are there. But if someone just loves to make you try to figure it out, um, that, that's a real problem. God is not doing that here. God is saying to them clearly that they are under judgment. And what did they do? You see this here, that they have taken a place called Mizpah and Tabor. There's a snare at Mizpah, and a, they've spread a net for like catching birds. That's a net that would catch birds at Tabor. And here's, here's ba- basically what they did at Mizpah and Tabor. Those are high places. And they turned those high places into wicked, idolatrous places of sacrifice. 
In fact, let's look on and let's see in verse 2. Look what it says. And the revolters have gone deep into slaughter. Underline that part, deep into slaughter. We're not exactly sure exactly what that means, but here's what it most likely means. Child sacrifice. They have come deep into slaughter. They've not just taken the goats and the lambs and the bulls in this, but now they've gone deep into the issue of child sacrifice. And the idea here is that they are, they are offering up sacrifices, child sacrifices, to Moloch. In Moloch, we see over and over again in the Old Testament, it comes up in different, point, different forms, um, uh, a form of Baal, but Moloch was a Phoenician god. He had the, the torso of a man, and he had the head of a bull, and he had arms that were out. We found these in ruins. He had arms that were out, and those arms that were out would be a place of even human sacrifice. And so a young parent with their firstborn, male or female, would bring their firstborn to the ceremony in front of Moloch. A massive fire would be burning. The piece of metal would be brazing, blazing hot, and the fire would be there in front of it, and they would place their child, their firstborn child, on those iron hands. And the, bo- the baby would be consumed, and the picture was is that if you would do this, then Moloch would guarantee that you would have financial success and that you would have fertility for more children. So come and give your firstborn to Moloch, and then he will do this. So the Phoenicians believed that. The Phoenicians practiced that. And what does Israel come along and begin to do? They adopt the gods that are around them instead of looking to the one true God. And so this is a very disturbing look, and we see in verse 2, the revolters, you see, that's what God calls them, this is a revolt against me, have gone deep into slaughter. But look at that next phrase, but I will discipline them. You see, he disciplines those whom he loves. I've included some passages here, Hebrews 12, 6, Deuteronomy 8, 4, and several others. And the picture is is that whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. If you're not disciplined by God, it may mean that you don't know God and that you're not one of his children. Whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. And so we see that this is actually, chapter 5, is a gracious response God hasn't written off his promise to Israel. God is going to deal with Israel, and he is going to, look at the bottom of verse 2, it says, I will discipline all of them. You see, if he did not care about them, it would simply say, I will destroy you and forget about you. But that's not what he's going to do. Look at verse 3 and 4. I know Ephraim. And Israel is not hidden from me. For now, O Ephraim, you have played the whore. They've gone out after other gods, unfaithful to God. Israel is defiled, verse 4. Their deeds do not permit them to return to their God, for the spirit of whoredom is within them, and they know not the Lord. Now, this is the the whole picture that, that God knows, fill this in, God knows and he sees us. Look at verse 3. It says in verse, right there in verse 3, I know Ephraim, and Israel is not hidden from me. I know you. God knows, and he sees us, even when we do not know him. Look at the bottom of verse 4. It says, and they, do, and they know not the Lord. Do you see the difference between the beginning of verse 3 and the bottom of verse 4, the last part of verse 4? He's saying, I know you, but you don't know me. Isn't that what we saw last week in, verse, in chapter 4, or two weeks ago in chapter 4, when we saw that they had forgotten who God was. They had stopped teaching the law. They had stopped teaching the truth of God. And they, did, they came to where they didn't even know him. My friends, there are many churches today, there are many people who claim to be Christians today, and they really don't know who God is. 
They've ignored the Old Testament God. They've ignored the holiness and the grandeur of God. They've ignored the great sacrifice of God. They have ignored the great doctrine of our sinful hearts because they've paid no attention to what the Old Testament reveals to us. You see, friends, we, as we look at what Israel does and as we look at how God deals with them, we can learn much about what what God is doing within us and how he comes to work within us as well. Fill this in. Our sin is known by the Lord. That's what we see in verses three and four. Our sin keeps us from the Lord. Look at verse four. It says, their deeds do not permit them to return to their God for the spirit of whoredom is within them. So their sin is known by the Lord. It keeps them from the Lord. And at the end of it, we see that they do not know God. Our sin blinds us to the Lord, to where we can't even see him. And that's what happens when we run off in our sin. That's what happens when we ignore God. We, we, we don't even know what he's saying. We don't even know who he is anymore. We can be completely blinded in our sin. Occasionally as pastors, and maybe for you as, as Christians, you have seen folks who seem to have walked with the Lord, but then they begin to drift away from the Lord, and they begin to fall into an area of sin, and before very long, they, they seem to just, they, they go away in such a way that they look at you when you talk to them like you're crazy. Why are you even talking to me about this? I mean, I am living my life. I am doing my thing. Yeah, I used to think that, but I don't anymore. And they, they get to the where they don't even know God. Now, God is saying for his children, no, I call you to return to me. I call you to come back to me. Look at verses 5, 6, and 7. The pride of Israel testifies to his face. Israel and Ephraim shall stumble in his guilt. Judah also shall stumble. So that not only the northern kingdom, but the southern kingdom will as well. They're going to stumble. Look at verse 6. With their flocks and herds, they shall go to seek the Lord. You go, oh, that's good. With their flock, that means they're going to go offer up sacrifices with their flocks and herds, the way the Old Testament says that they should do, the way the law says that they should do. But look in the middle of verse 6. But they will not find him. He has withdrawn from them. They have dealt faithlessly with the Lord, for they have borne alien children. You remember the, Hosea's two children that were not from him, that Hosea, that Gomer gave, not mercy and, and um, not my people. So they have borne alien children. Now the new moon shall devour them with their fields. So let's look and let's see what a few of these things mean. First of all, pride always leads to disgrace and destruction. You see in verse 5 it says, the pride of Israel testifies to his face. This is the, the pride comes before a fall. Numerous places in the scripture we are warned that if you walk in pride, you are going to fall. You are going to be destroyed. And that's what these verses show. Notice the next part. God cannot be appeased by religious acts. And that's what we see in verse 6. We look what it says in verse 6. With their flocks and herds, they shall go to seek the Lord, but they will not find him. He has withdrawn from him. Here's the idea. They're, just, they're seeing their trouble. They're seeing their struggle, and they're saying, hey, let's get some, get some bulls and some goats. Get the people together. Let's go back, and let's, let's try God again. We kind of forgot his number, but I think we can find it. And if we can try this again, you know, maybe he'll come and give us relief. You see, in mercy, God does not respond to quick fixes. In mercy, he does not respond to our quick fixes. This is when you're buzzing along in life, ignoring God, you start making some bad decisions, and then something kind of goes wrong, and you kind of come run into church and say, man, I haven't been here. Get get out the checkbook. Get, get, you know, husband, get the checkbook. Write write a check to these people. Uh, We should have been doing this, and go change a diaper in the nursery. I mean, we need to get back with the program here, and real quick, because our life is falling apart. And, And we immediately think that there's some quick run to, to not miss what we've been setting up that seems to be slipping away. God is not going to be appeased by little religious acts that are not from the heart. You see, we begin to see and fill this in that God's silence 
awaits genuine repentance. God is not looking for your little acts of religiosity. God is looking for a heart that is broken. And that's Israel's problem. Verses 8 through 15, really 8 through 14, show this civil war between Israel and Judah. I mean, this is so horrible that God's people that were once united are now divided. And not only are they divided, but now they're fighting with each other and they're seeking to destroy one another. Uh, some of you have more than one child and you know what it's like when your kids fight. And you look at them and you're going, why do you guys do this? Um, and, you know, you're, you're frustrated with that. And sometimes it's just, it's frustrating. Sometimes it's angry and sometimes it's sad to you. But I want you to think about what God is seeing and what God is dealing with as Israel, is, as just the, the complete squirrel is occurring and there is this civil war between the two, and disaster is coming. In verse 8, it says, Blow the horn in Gibeah, and the trumpet in Ramah, and sound the alarm in beth -Avon. We follow you, O Benjamin. Verse 9, Ephraim shall become a desolation in the day of punishment among the tribes of Israel. I make known what is sure. So he's saying, you can rest assured that what I'm about to tell you is going to happen. Verse 10, the princes of Judah, so that's the southern kingdom, have become like those who move the landmark. Now, what does that mean, those who move the landmark? It means they're corrupt. It's somebody going out there and changing the survey stakes. You know, you go to buy a house, and the surveyor comes, and he puts the stakes out here, and he shows you where your land is, and somebody goes out there at night and moves the stakes. I mean, I, you know, that, that kind of, that, it's, it's a dishonesty that is here. And these are the princes of Judah that are corrupt, like those who move the landmark. Upon them, I will pour out my wrath like water. Ephraim is oppressed and crushed in judgment because he is determined to go after filth. Underline that. He is determined to go after what? Filth. You see, that's how God looks at our foolish rebellion running after ourselves. Verse 12, but I am like a moth to Ephraim and like dry rot to the house of Judah. I want you to see this as we, as we look. The civil war between Judah, their foolish sin brings disaster upon themselves. And there's a, there's a narrative there from 2 Kings chapter 16, verse 5 through 9, and you can read all of that, and you can see that there's, there's this toying back and forth. But the bottom line is this, is that they go after two other pagan kingdoms, and they're siding with other pagan kingdoms against their own brothers, and ultimately, they get crushed for it. Ephraim thinks, ooh, I'm going to patch things up. And he seeks to make friends also with, with Assyria. And Assyria invades Israel and Syria. And then when they patch it up, Assyria comes back and crushes all of them. That's the, that's the bottom line. Look at verse 11. Ephraim is oppressed and crushed in judgment because he was determined to go after filth. But I am like a moth to Ephraim and like dry rot to the house of Israel. Would you please circle the word I in verse 12? It doesn't say that the other nations are like a moth to, is, to them. Now think about a moth. Have any of you ever had a moth in your clothes closet or in your drawers? Yeah, not in your drawers, but I mean in, in your drawer of clothes, chest of drawers. It's, a moth can just eat things up. I personally have never experienced that just because we, we always had mothballs or something like that. But there are people who pull things out of the clothes and the moths have eaten everything. There, there are some who grew up in a circumstance that maybe out in the country or something like that where the moths come and ruin anything that's made of fabric. And, or if it's not of fabric, maybe it's of wood that like dry rot in the house of Judah. God is saying, you know what the moth is and you know what the dry rot is? It's me. God is saying, I am bringing this judgment on you. And so that when we start to see, and notice this in verse 13, when Ephraim saw his sickness and Judah his wound, so we're telling north and south, they see 
the sickness and the wound. Then Ephraim went to Syria. This is when he was going out to try to patch things up. Sent to the great king, but he is not able to cure you or heal your wound. You see, they're not calling out of God. They're calling out to pagan kings. Verse 14, for I, circle that, I will be like a lion to Ephraim and like a young lion to the house of Judah. That means a strong lion, a young lion that's very strong. I, I've underlined it for you, even I will tear and go away. I will carry off and not, no one shall rescue. I want you to see a few things here on the right-hand side. When our sin snowballs into greater trouble, seeking ungodly fixes only makes matters worse. When you go off and you get away from God and you start making decisions that are bad, and you start choosing your own life, you're in charge, you're making the shots, and you, you, you either go into a line of work or you go into um, a relationship or you go into things that you know are not God's will, and you begin to run in your sin away from God, no longer listening and worshiping God, and then when trouble comes to that and you seek to go fix it, very often when we look at something other than God, it just makes matters worse. You see, here's the thing that we need to see. The world does not have the solution to the problems that arise from unfaithfulness to God. The nation of Ephraim, or the tribe of Ephraim, they ran out to Assyria to go get help. And, and what did Assyria wind up coming back and doing? Crushed them. The world doesn't have the solution to the problems that arise from unfaithfulness to God. Notice the next part. God in his mercy will confuse and crush our earthly schemes for relief and peace. Some of you have lived long enough to say that is true. I'm going to fix my problem that started with sin, and I'm going to go do something else, and I'm going to fix it myself. And then as we go out there and fix it ourselves, then we find that we're in a bigger mess than we were in the first place. My friends, this is the picture of what happens. Our earthly schemes, God says, I'm not going to let that satisfy you because you're mine and I want you to look to me. I'm going to make those things wind up being unproductive to solve your problem. That's what he's doing in Hosea chapter 5. Notice the last part here. Again, God has all the time in the world. In mercy... And love, he will withdraw himself until his true children are ready to genuinely repent. Now look back over at verse 15. Look what it says in verse 15. Last verse in chapter 5. He says, I will return again to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. And in their distress, which, by the way, he would say, I have caused, and in their distress, earnestly seek me. You see, there is what God is looking for. God is looking that we would turn away from our worshiping other gods, that we would turn away from our sinfulness, that we would turn away from our selfishness, that we would turn away from living for ourselves in this earthly life, and that we would turn to him in worship acknowledge our sin. So this is repentance. He will withdraw himself until his true children are ready to genuinely repent. And what is repentance except that acknowledge your sin to God? That's what it says there in the middle of verse 15, until they acknowledge their guilt. When it's time to turn back to God, you go to God and you say, God, this is how I've sinned against you. Lord, this is how I've not listened to you. This is what I've done. This is what I've said. You don't make excuses to God. You don't come and you don't kind of only confess part of it. Instead, you say, Lord, I did this because I don't love you like the way I should love you. You go ahead and you lay all of the cards on the table. If you want to be right with God, you acknowledge to him the problem that he already knows, and he knows it better than you do. 
But you see, it wasn't that God didn't know, it's that, that they would not repent. So, repentance, acknowledge sin to God, and then the next part we see here, and seek my face, and in their distress, earnestly seek me. You acknowledge sin to God, and you turn from sin to God. That's what it means to repent, that you declare your sin to God, and then you turn away from it. It's 1213. In five minutes, we're going to be done. (laughs) Psalm 51 is one of the most important psalms for Andrew Coleman. Psalm 51 was one of the psalms that God began to show me what does it mean to come to God and to repent before God. And it's very interesting that, you know, on the first sheet, we were looking at Saul, David, and Solomon. And David, he was flawed. He wasn't perfect. He was flawed. Think Bathsheba. Think other things that he did that were not right. But he was still faithful to God. He, w- he didn't go out and worship other gods. He didn't die in rebellion against God. David blessed the Lord in his frailty. He knew how to repent before God. And in fact, Psalm 51 is a psalm of David, and you may want to put out there, flawed but faithful, out there to the side. But it's when Nathan the prophet went to him after he had gone into Bathsheba, and the idea was he went and stole another man's wife. And God raised up a prophet, like Hosea, but God raised up Nathan, who was a prophet, told David a story and said, and David said, who did this? And he shook his bony finger in the king's face and he said, you are the man who did this. You have stolen this little lamb and consumed it for your own appeasement. And so when that happened, David turned to God in proper repentance. Look with me at Psalm 51 and verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin, underline it, is ever, is ever before me. See, he's not holding back. Verse 4, against you and you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight so that you are justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. I'm going to read that again. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, you delight in truth in the inward being, and you teach me wisdom in the secret heart. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all of my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Do you see the the very thing that we see that God is doing with Israel in Hosea chapter 5, he's saying, I'm not, I'm not going to be with them. I'm not going to listen to them. Here's, this is what David doesn't want. Verse 11, cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways and sinners will return to you. Deliver me from blood guiltiness. He's got blood on his hands. Oh God, 
O God of my salvation, and my tongue will sing aloud of your righteousness. O Lord, open my lips, and my mouth will declare your praise. For you, this is important, verse 16, for you will not delight in sacrifice, or I would give it. You are not pleased with a burnt offering. Circle all of 17. Let's read 17 out loud. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. This is how we repent. This is how we come before God. We don't hide our sin, but we lay it open and we see that he is interested in the inward person. Verse 18, do good to Zion and your good pleasure. Build up the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in right sacrifices. Right sacrifices. Not band-aid sacrifices. Not little patches. Not, oh, let's see if we can get God to be nicer to us. But true brokenness. In burnt offerings and in whole burnt offerings, then bulls will be offered on your altar. Are you being faithful to God in his ways or are you being faithful to yourself in your ways? See, we can't just look at the picture of Moloch and say, well, I'm glad I'm not one of those people offering up my firstborn to Moloch. Cheryl Ann's here. I didn't give her up to that. Oh, no, but friends, we can still have other gods. We can still be honoring ourselves and look pretty shiny on the outside. Here's a question. When God convicts you of sin, what is your response to him? You know one of the biggest responses that we have in this modern day and time? Ignore him. Just ignore him. Or rationalize or go seek to offer up a little sacrifice. We turn to God through, final, for, through the final sacrifice of Jesus. By faith we repent and believe. This is our hope. Ultimately, we see that the sacrifice of Jesus is what all of this comes back to. The fact that Jesus would be the last and final hope that allows us to honor God in true repentance. Would you stand with me for prayer?